The Cretaceous period is the third and final period of the Mesozoic era and lasted from about 145 to 66 million years ago. During this time, the Earth pulsated with life as majestic dinosaurs dominated the landscapes, shaping the very essence of our planet's history. Imagine a heavily armored Ankylosaurus, a gigantic Argentinosaurus reaching 35 meters or 115 feet in length, and a formidable Carcharodontosaurus that looks even more threatening than the name suggests. The Cretaceous period was a time when some of the most awe-inspiring herbivores, such as Parasaurolophus, a dinosaur with a banana head, and most terrifying predators like T. rex, Spinosaurus, and Carnotaurus roamed the planet. That was the time when none of these creatures were willing to give up an inch, and there was an endless struggle for the right to survive. This is the Cretaceous period. Parasaurolophus Parasaurolophus is a genus of hadrosaurid duck-billed dinosaur that lived in what is now Western North America and possibly Asia during the late Cretaceous period about 76.9 to 70.5 million years ago. It was a large herbivore that could reach over 9 meters or 30 feet long and weigh over 5 tons, and were able to move as a biped and a quadruped. These species are universally recognized. Parasaurolophus walkeri, Parasaurolophus tubisan, and the short-crested Parasaurolophus cetocristatus. The genus was first described in 1922 by William Parks from a skull and partial skeleton found in Alberta. Remains of this fascinating dinosaur are known from Alberta, New Mexico, and Utah. Parasaurolophus belonged to a diverse family of large late Cretaceous ornithopods that are known for their range of bizarre head adornments, which were likely used for communication and increased hearing. Caronosaurus from China, which may have been its closest relative, had a similar skull and potentially similar crest. Visual recognition of both species and sex, acoustic resonance, and thermoregulation have been proposed as functional explanations for the crest. Parasaurolophus likely fed on plants, including ferns and cycads. With a beak-like mouth and strong teeth, this herbivore could easily chew through vegetation from the ground up to a height of around 4 meters. A peaceful grazer likely spent most of its time eating and looking for predators. It ate plants with a sophisticated skull that permitted a grinding motion similar to chewing. The dinosaur had teeth packed into dental batteries that contained hundreds of teeth, which were continually replaced. Initially, it was suggested that the hollow crest might function as a snorkel, allowing the dinosaur to protrude it from the water while grazing on aquatic plants. However, this idea was debunked because the crest's tip is entirely solid, preventing air exchange. Another theory proposed that the crest acted as an additional air reservoir for scuba-like diving. According to this concept, the dinosaur could breathe in through its nose, filling the crest with fresh air. When diving to forage underwater, it could then use this stored air supply by breathing it through its throat to extend its submersion time. However, studies reveal that duckbell dinosaurs' forepaw tracks have definitively dis proven prior belief that they had webbed feet. Surprisingly, these dinosaurs had padded hands, not adapted for water paddling, but more like the cushioned feet of camels for walking on solid, dry terrain. This discovery reshaped understanding of duckbell's ecology, suggesting they were not divers, which aligns with various other reasons. For example, their robust teeth and jaws far exceeded the requirements for chewing soft, aquatic plants. Beelzebufo Ampinga Beelzebufo Ampinga, known as the Devil Frog, was probably the largest frog to have ever existed. These extinct amphibians reached lengths of up to 16 inches or 41 centimeters and weighed around 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms. 
they roamed the islands of Madagascar during the late Cretaceous period, approximately 65 to 70 million years ago. The ancient devil frogs may have snatched lizards, small vertebrates, and possibly even hatchling dinosaurs with their huge mouths and powerful jaws. The discovery of Beelzebufo occurred in 1993, and it took around 15 years for this species to be described, done so in 2008 by paleontologists working at Stony Brook University. Only fragments of this frog have been discovered, which have been pieced together from around 75 different specimens, none nearly complete. Beelzebufo most likely had horns on their heads and possibly had a shell-like armor on it to defend itself from predators. Similar to frogs today, Beelzebufo was likely able to enter a state of brumation and become inactive to survive periods of extreme weather conditions. Using the bite force of modern frogs and scaling them to the size of Beelzebufo, scientists have been able to figure out the bite force of this massive amphibian. Beelzebufo had a bite force estimated at 2200 newtons, which helped them crush their prey and allowed them to feed on smaller baby theropods. Its predatory behavior was likely similar to other giant frogs of today like the bullfrog, who are very aggressive ambush predators that jump at their prey and feed on anything that fits in their mouth. Similar to modern day frogs, Beelzebufo probably laid eggs in aquatic habitats and began life as tadpoles, nourishing themselves on aquatic matter. Edmontosaurus Edmontosaurus is a genus of hadrosaurid, duck-billed dinosaur that contains two known species, Edmontosaurus regalis and Edmontosaurus anectans. Fossils of Edmontosaurus regalis have been found in rocks of western North America that date from the late Campanian age of the Cretaceous period, 73 million years ago while those of Edmontosaurus and Nectans dated to the end of the Maastrichtian age, 66 million years ago. Edmontosaurus and Nectans measured up to 12 meters or 39 feet in length and weighing around 5.6 tons, although some individuals would have been much larger. Edmontosaurus lacked large hollow crests and instead had smaller solid crests or fleshy combs. The first fossils named Edmontosaurus were discovered in 1917 in the Horseshoe Canyon formation along the Red Deer River of southern Alberta. It was widely distributed across western North America, ranging from Colorado to the northern slopes of Alaska. The distribution of Edmontosaurus fossils suggests that it preferred coasts and coastal plains. It was a herbivore that could move on both two legs and four. Because it is known from several bone beds, Edmontosaurus is thought to have lived in groups and may have been migratory as well. Although fastest running speed cannot be determined from trackways, computer modeling suggests that a subadult Edmontosaurus could have galloped at a speed of up to 57 kilometers an hour or 35 miles per hour. Edmontosaurus babies weighed about the same as a human baby, despite being roughly twice as long. This is because Edmontosaurus, like most dinosaurs, had very long, very light tails. A beautifully preserved new fossil shows Edmontosaurus boasted a party hat of jiggly flesh atop its head. Researchers theorize that like a rooster's coxcomb, the crest was brightly colored and served as a signal to others of its kind. Several specimens of Edmontosaurus include vast expanses of fossilized skin. These mummies demonstrate that Edmontosaurus was covered with scales. It was thought the abnormal abundance of skin impressions and mummies were due to the fact that the dinosaurs were extremely common and or they spent most of their time near water. Paleontologists speculate that the primary reason for the thick skin of hadrosaurs, particularly Edmontosaurus, was to defend against tyrannosaur predators. This thicker skin would provide added protection and potentially increase their chances of survival during encounters with tyrannosaurs. While long thought to have been aquatic or semi-aquatic, 
hadrosaurids were not as well suited for swimming. Hadrosaurids had slim hands with short fingers, making their forelimbs ineffective for propulsion, and the tail was not useful for propulsion because of the ossified tendons that increased its rigidity and the poorly developed attachment points for muscles that would have moved the tail from side to side. Paleontologists also believe hadrosaurines, including Edmontosaurus, may have had inflatable air sacs on their snouts, somewhat like the inflatable noses of male elephant seals today. These hypothetical soft tissue structures could have been used to attract mates or amplify calls. Carnotaurus Carnotaurus is a genus of theropod dinosaur that lived in South America during the late Cretaceous period, between 71 and 69 million years ago. A single well-preserved skeleton of Carnotaurus sastre was uncovered in 1984 in the Chubut province of Argentina from rocks of the La Colonia formation. The dinosaur's name, translating to meat-eating bull, aptly describes this predator's striking pair of horns above its eyes. Measuring between 7.5 to 8 meters, or 24.6 to 26.2 feet in length, Carnotaurus falls into the category of large theropods. However, it was lightly built compared to its contemporaries, with weight estimates ranging from 1.3 to 2.1 tons. This build suggests a predator designed for speed, capable of quick movements to catch prey or evade competition. Carnotaurus is a derived member of the Abelosauridae, a group of large theropods that occupied the large predatorial niche in the southern land masses of Gondwana during the late Cretaceous. The horns hint at a complex behavior possibly involving combat or display. Supporting these formidable horns was a deep, muscular neck which would have been essential for withstanding the stresses of combat. Even though Carnotaurus was not a fluffy guy, the skeleton is preserved with extensive skin impressions, showing a mosaic of small scales, approximately 5 mm in diameter. The dietary preferences of Carnotaurus are unclear. Certain studies propose that the creature could take down sizable prey, like sauropods, whereas others indicate a preference for smaller animals. Examination of its brain cavity hints at a keen sense of smell, with comparatively lesser development in hearing and sight. Analyses of the jaw structure of Carnotaurus suggest that the animal was capable of quick bites, but not strong ones. Quick bites are more important than strong bites when capturing small prey, as shown by studies of modern-day crocodiles. Furthermore, Paleontologist Gerardo Massetta observed significant flexibility within the skull, particularly in the lower jaw, reminiscent of modern snakes. This jaw elasticity likely facilitated the ingestion of small prey whole. Carnotaurus's hind limbs were notably long and muscular, with a strong femur and elongated tibia, typical of fast-moving predators. This leg structure and a relatively light body would have allowed Carnotaurus to make quick, powerful strides. The tail was stiffened by elongated bony projections and interlocking vertebrae. This rigidity would have made the tail an effective counterbalance during fast running, allowing for more efficient forward motion by reducing side-to-side -side movement. Additionally, the tail housed large chordofemoralis muscles, which would have been key in propelling the dinosaur forward by pulling the leg backward with great force. Research, including biochemical modeling and comparisons with the limb proportions of present-day bipedal runners, indicates that Carnotaurus might have been capable of attaining speeds ranging from 48 to 56 km per hour, or 30 to 35 miles per hour. Carnotaurus sastre roamed Gondwana's vast landscapes approximately 70 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period. This era was defined by a warm climate, featuring ecosystems from coastal beaches to dense forests. Carnotaurus made its home in the La Colonia Formation, teeming with conifers, ferns, and angiosperms. Its environment also included other dinosaur species, crocodiles, turtles, and various small mammals. This diversity 
points to a complex ecosystem where Carnotaurus might have dominated the food chain, asserting its role as an apex predator within late Cretaceous Gondwana. Spinosaurus More than 95 million years ago, a mighty river system flowed through what is now the Moroccan Sahara, providing a home to one of the most unusual dinosaurs known to science, Spinosaurus, a 49-foot-long, 7-ton beast with a crocodile-like snout that bristled with conical teeth. The best-known species is Spinosaurus aegyptiacus from Egypt, although a potential second species, Spinosaurus moroccanus, has been recovered from Morocco. According to the 2022 study, Spinosaurus aegyptiacus reached a maximum body length of 14 meters or 46 feet and a maximum body mass of 7.4 tons. The skull of Spinosaurus was long, low and narrow, similar to that of a modern crocodilian, and bore straight conical teeth with no serrations. It would have had large, robust forelimbs, bearing three-fingered hands with an enlarged claw on the first digit. The distinctive neural spines of Spinosaurus, which were long extensions of the vertebrae, grew to at least 1.65 meters or 5.4 feet long and were likely to have had skin connecting them, forming a sail-like structure, although some authors have suggested that the spines were covered in fat and formed a hump. Spinosaurus had an anterior bite force of 4,829 newtons and a posterior bite force of 11,936 newtons. The jaws of Spinosaurus are adapted for generating relatively faster shutting speeds with less muscle input force, indicating that the animal likely killed its prey with fast snapping jaws rather than slow crushing bites. There are a number of suggestions related to the neural spine of Spinosaurus. Early theories proposed they helped maintain the animal's body temperature inside an optimal range, but these have largely been ruled out. Our best bet right now is that these spiny lizard spines were used more for display purposes, maybe for a bit of balancing as well. Alternatively, it could have been used to intimidate potential threats, as it almost doubled the apparent body size of Spinosaurus when fully deployed. It is also suggested that Spinosaurus used its dorsal neural sail in the same manner as sailfish, and that it also employed its long, narrow tail to stun prey like a modern thresher shark, in case if it was a really aquatic dinosaur. But did it just wade into rivers and snatch them out of the water like a grizzly bear? Or did it dive after its prey like a penguin or a sea lion? Some modern aquatic mammals like manatees have swollen, dense bones to help them stay underwater, like a scuba diver's weight belt. Large land animals like elephants also have dense bones to support their increased body mass. Most modern birds and many dinosaurs, including Spinosaurus, have the opposite conditions, with air sacs attached to lungs or inside bones that act like a life vest, preventing submergence. Assessing the aquatic abilities of an extinct species like Spinosaurus needs to take account of all these factors. Paleontologists at the University of Chicago suggests that Spinosaurus needed extra bone strength to support its weight on its relatively short hind limbs. It was able to wade into waterways more than six feet deep without floating, where it could ambush fish of any size with its claws and jaws, but all while keeping its toes firmly anchored in the mud. Spinosaurus was often depicted in the mid-20th century as an obligate quadruped akin to Dimetrodon, Starting in the mid-1970s, it was hypothesized Spinosaurus was at least an occasional quadruped, bolstered by the discovery of Baryonyx, a relative with robust arms. But a 2024 article co-authored by Paul Serino stated that the previous calculations that were used to argue quadrupedality for Spinosaurus had erroneously shifted the center of mass in front of the hips. They instead suggested that the dinosaur fit the criteria of being a graviportal or slow-moving biped. Triceratops Triceratops, a genus of plant-eating horned dinosaur, comprised two species, Triceratops horridus and Triceratops prorsus. 
and lived between 68 million and 66 million years ago during the late Cretaceous period. Triceratops remains, more abundant in the United States than in Canada, were first discovered in southern Saskatchewan by paleontologist Charles Sternberg in 1921, with subsequent findings in Alberta. Adult individuals measured between 8 and 9 meters long and weighed as much as 5 to 9 tons. Triceratops had two horns above its eyes, a parrot-like beak and a smaller horn on its snout. The larger horns measured almost 1 meter. A frill measuring up to 2 meters ran along the back of its skull, framing its face. Paleontologists believe the frill was for protection, recognizing their species and to attract mates. Triceratops is known to have preserved skin, characterized by large scales, some measuring over 100 millimeters or 3.9 inches across, featuring conical projections rising from their centers. Additionally, a preserved fragment of skin from the frill of a specimen reveals small polygonal basement scales. Triceratops was not the only horned dinosaur of its time. It belonged to a group known as ceratopsids. Ceratopsids, recognized for their intricate frills, beak-like mouths, and often imposing horns, thrived during the late Cretaceous period, inhabiting the regions of present-day North America and Asia. Among them were species like the Styracosaurus, distinguished by spikes extending from their frills, and the pint-sized Protoceratops, measuring less than a meter high and lacking elaborate horns, but still displaying familial traits. All Ceratopsids walked on four legs, possessed robust builds, lived in herds, and were exclusively herbivorous, consuming high-fiber plant material aided by specialized dental structures and likely employing fermentation with gut microflora for digestion. Although no Triceratops eggs have been discovered, most paleontologists believe that all dinosaurs reproduced by laying eggs. See dinosaur eggs. In general, dinosaur eggs took three to six months to hatch and juvenile dinosaurs a year or more to reach sexual maturity. Young Triceratops had little stumps for horns. The horns curved backwards and twisted and lengthened as the juvenile grew. As Triceratops grew, the horns would straighten, reaching up to one meter in length. Fossils suggest that Triceratops and T. rex likely crossed paths, leading to dramatic confrontations that have ignited the imaginations of many. One clear evidence of this is the Montana dueling dinosaur fossil, where both dinosaurs ended up dying and getting buried in the same place. Although it isn't clear if both dinosaurs were buried while fighting one another or if they killed each other, it's clear that they faced off. In fact, a tooth from the Tyrannosaurus was found embedded within the Triceratops' body. In this situation, neither of these two dinosaurs emerged victorious. But as the bigger and more efficient killer, there were probably other instances where the T-Rex came out top and successfully preyed on Triceratops. If this matchup were to ever happen between two mature T. rex and Triceratops, there's a good chance that the Tyrannosaurus would emerge as the victor. However, the Triceratops is one of those big and strong enough dinosaurs to be successfully able to kill a Tyrannosaurus rex. Acrocanthosaurus Acrocanthosaurus is a genus of Carcharodontosaurid dinosaur that existed in what is now North America during the Aptian and early Albion stages of the early Cretaceous, from 113 to 110 million years ago. Acrocanthosaurus is comprised of only one species, Acrocanthosaurus atokensis, which inhabited a vast geographic range extending across the continent. Fossil evidence of this species has been discovered in various locations, including the U.S. states of Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming in the western regions, as well as Maryland in the east. It is best known for the high neural spines on many of its vertebrae, which most likely supported a ridge of muscle over the animal's neck, back, and hips. Acrocanthosaurus was one of the largest theropods, with the largest known specimen reaching 11 to 11.5 meters, or 36 to 38 feet in length, and weighing approximately 4.4 to 6.6 tons. Large theropod footprints discovered in Texas may have been made by Acrocanthosaurus, although there is no direct association with skeletal remains. From the bone features of the holotype, 
It is estimated that Acrocanthosaurus required from 12 to 24 years to fully grow. The bite force of Acrocanthosaurus was studied and compared with that of 33 other dinosaurs and is calculated to be around 8200 newtons at the anterior part of the jaws, while the posterior bite force was estimated to be 16,894 newtons. As mentioned previously, Acrocanthosaurus was probably a slow-moving dinosaur, or at the very least, not a proficient runner. This is indicated by the fact that its femur, thigh bone, was longer than the tibia, the leg bone below the knee, and the metatarsals, foot bones. Despite its potentially limited running ability, Acrocanthosaurus was an efficient predator, especially since it's known to have likely had a good sense of smell. Its forelimbs also were of help in the process. Paleontologists reached this conclusion after studying the range of motion of Acrocanthosaurus forelimbs. Studies showed that while these dinosaurs couldn't swing their arms in full circles as we can, they could swing them backward at an angle of 109 degrees from the vertical. On the other hand, forward swinging was possible only at 24 degrees from the vertical. All of this suggests that while hunting and catching prey, the Acrocanthosaurus likely used its head first, but once it captured prey with its jaws, it used its forelimbs and the claws on the first two digits to hold the prey tightly against its body. It might have dispatched it using its jaws or torn it apart using its claws. Velociraptor Velociraptor is a genus of small dromaeosaurid dinosaurs that lived in Asia during the late Cretaceous epoch, about 75 million to 71 million years ago. The type species is Velociraptor mongoliensis, named and described in 1924. Smaller than Deinonychus, Velociraptor was about 1.5 to 2.07 meters, or 4.9 to 6.8 feet long, with a body mass around 14.1 to 19.7 kilograms, or 31 to 43 pounds. It was a bipedal feathered carnivore, with a long tail and an enlarged sickle-shaped claw on each hind foot, which is thought to have been used to tackle and restrain prey. Velociraptor can be distinguished from other dromaeosaurids by its long and low skull, with an upturned snout. Examinations of the endocranium of Velociraptor indicates that it was able to detect and hear a wide range of sound frequencies, 2,368 to 3,965 hertz, and could track prey with ease as a result. The endocranium examinations also further cemented the theory that the dromaeosaur was an agile, swift predator. Fossil evidence suggesting Velociraptor scavenged also indicates that it was an opportunistic and actively predatory animal, feeding on carrion during times of drought or famine, if in poor health or depending on the animal's age. Because of this famous fossil, Velociraptor is often seen as the perpetual enemy of Protoceratops, but it seems very unlikely that Velociraptor would have habitually preyed upon it. Velociraptor probably mostly fed on relatively small mammals and reptiles that would have been easy to overpower and kill. It may have occasionally hunted small infant dinosaurs. In Mongolia, where Velociraptor lived, this could have included young Protoceratops as well as baby Oviraptor. It is estimated that a Velociraptor was able to run at over 40 kilometers per hour, or 24.8 miles an hour, at least in short bursts, faster than the fastest human. It would have been quite fast by dinosaur standards. Raptors were not particularly brawny, at least compared to some other dinosaurs. So evidence suggests that they hunted in packs and were social hunters, but this evidence is very weak. The only solid evidence for this behavior comes from fossils in China which show six individuals moving together as a group, but plenty of other fossils suggest isolated individuals. While the Velociraptor was featherless in the movies, paleontologists discovered quill knobs, places where the flight-related feathers of birds are anchored to the bone, on a well-preserved Velociraptor forearm in Mongolia in 2007, indicating the dinosaur had feathers. Despite having feathers, however, the arms of Velociraptors were too short to allow them to fly or even glide. The find suggests that the dinosaur's dromaeosaurid ancestors could fly at one point, but lost that ability. 
Velociraptor retained its feathers and possibly used them to attract mates, regulate body temperature, protect eggs from the environment, or generate thrust and speed while running up inclines. Troodon Troodon was a small bird-like dinosaur that lived during the Cretaceous period, about 76 million years ago. It stood about 3.3 meters or 11 feet tall and weighed about 49.9 kilograms or 110 pounds. Troodon had a very large brain for its size, even larger, relatively speaking, than the brains of modern reptiles. That suggests it may have been smarter than the average dinosaur, and perhaps even as intelligent as modern birds. Not only were the eyes of Troodon larger than normal, but they were set toward the front rather than the side of this dinosaur's face, an indication that Troodon possessed advanced binocular vision with which it could target small, skittering prey. By contrast, the eyes of many herbivorous animals are set toward the sides of their heads, an adaption that allows them to detect the presence of approaching carnivores. With its characteristic eyes, brain, and grasping hands, you might think Troodon was built exclusively for a predatory lifestyle. However, the distinct possibility exists that this dinosaur was an opportunistic omnivore, feeding on seeds, nuts, and fruits, as well as smaller mammals, birds, and dinosaurs. Most dinosaurs are thought to have laid eggs en masse and buried them in the ground for incubation, like crocodiles and other cold-blooded reptiles do today, but not Troodon. Now, fossilized eggshells have revealed that Troodons were endotherms, meaning they were warm-blooded and could self-regulate their body temperature. This confirms that the dinosaurs could maintain their body temperature high enough to brood their eggs. Our study indicates that Troodon had a high body temperature, like birds, so it certainly would have been capable of providing heat for incubation while sitting on its eggs. What's more, these dinosaurs could probably switch between a warm-blooded state and a state of cold-blooded torpor, a strategy common in modern birds called heterothermy. Troodon maintained its body temperature around 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 42 degrees Celsius, but it could drop it to 84.2 Fahrenheit, or 29 C, to cope with limited food or harsh weather. It is also one of the fastest dinosaurs, reaching speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour, or 49.7 miles per hour. For decades, it's been suggested that troodontids with large orbitals may have been nocturnal, using their big eyes like a flightless owl to see in the low light as they hunted. This is bolstered by the fact that troodontids are some of the most common dinosaurs known from Arctic regions like Alaska. Since these small theropods were likely incapable of migrating out of this region during the winter, they simply would have had to stay and make due. While the Arctic Circle may not have been as cold back then as it is today, it still had the 24-hour periods of darkness for large chunks of the year, so perhaps the big-eyed troodontids thrived in the endless winter night there millions of years ago. Mosasaurus over 66 million years ago, the oceans of the late Cretaceous period were home to terrifying sea monsters, such as the Mosasaurus. This extinct group of aquatic squamate reptiles, the largest order of reptiles, roamed the seas approximately 82 to 66 million years ago. With an estimated length of up to 13 meters or 42.6 feet for the largest specimen, these creatures were the ocean's apex predators. Mosasaurus had powerful jaws, strong swimming paddles, and a tail optimized for propulsion in the marine environment. The genus Mosasaurus was officially classified in 1822 by William Daniel Cornebeer. The ancient marine reptile's name is derived from the Meusa River near the discovery site and the Greek word for lizard, saurus. Mosasaurus featured a streamlined body specialized for aquatic life. Its skull sported a set of powerful jaws, filled with sharply pointed teeth capable of tearing into the flesh of its prey. Large, forward-facing eyes offered Mosasaurus a significant advantage in the dimly lit marine environments it inhabited. Such visual acuity would have been vital for identifying prey. Contrasting with its keen eyesight, Mosasaurus' sense of smell was diminished. Unlike most reptiles that lay eggs, Evidence suggests that Mosasaurus gave live birth to fully formed young. 
This viviparous reproduction strategy is a significant adaption that eliminated the need to return to land to lay eggs. Mosasaurus fossils found worldwide attest to its success in the late Cretaceous seas. North American fossils from the Western Interior Seaway show a preference for inland marine environments. In Europe, Mosasaurus adapted to various conditions in the Tethys Ocean, from temperate to tropical waters. Discoveries in Africa, the Middle East, and Antarctica reveal its wide distribution and ability to survive in diverse climates, including subpolar regions. This genus likely employed a blend of ambush and pursuit strategies to capture its prey. Its streamlined body and powerful, fluke-ended tail enabled rapid acceleration, making Mosasaurus an adept hunter capable of surprising its prey. Jormungandr wallahensis, a new species of Mosasaur, has transitional traits that place it between two well-known Mosasaurs, bringing researchers closer to understanding how different groups of Mosasaurs are related to each other. Jormungandr wallahensis is estimated to be about 7.3 meters or 24 feet long and would have lived about 80 million years ago, predating Mosasaurus. In addition to flippers and a stumpy shark-like tail, Jormungandr had a bony ridge on its skull that would have given it the appearance of having angry eyebrows. If you put flippers on a Komodo dragon and made it really big, that's basically what it would have looked like. Ankylosaurus Ankylosaurus magniventris, known as the prehistoric tank of the late Cretaceous, roamed the Earth around 70 to 66 million years ago. This massive quadrupedal dinosaur boasted a robust body adorned with bony plates embedded with spikes. Its tail featured fused plates, forming a formidable club used for defense against predators. Ankylosaurus is estimated to have been between 6 and 8 meters or 20 and 26 feet long and to have weighed between 4.8 and 8 tons. Ankylosaurus belongs to the Ankylosauridae family, with its closest kin believed to be Anodontosaurus and Euoplocephalus. Ankylosaurus is thought to have been a slow-moving animal, able to make quick movements when necessary. Its broad muzzle indicates it was a non-selective browser. Sinuses and nasal chambers in its snout potentially served functions related to heat and water balance or perhaps played a role in vocalization. The first Ankylosaurus bones were found in 1906 at the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, USA. Bonham Brown led the fossil hunting trip, the same scientist who led the discovery of Tyrannosaurus rex a few years earlier. The dinosaur's plates, differing in size, were arranged in orderly horizontal rows along its neck, back, and hips. Smaller plates or similar structures shielded the gaps between the larger ones, possibly extending to the tail and limbs. The densest concentration of armor was notably in the neck region. The dinosaur's triangular skull was wider than it was long and had a narrow beak at the end to aid in stripping leaves from plants. Its small leaf-shaped teeth were not designed to break up large plants, and it had no grinding teeth. Recent discoveries regarding another ankylosaurid, Zulcrurivastator, have shed new light on the function of the tail club. The fossilized remains of this animal show marks of intraspecific combat. Zul, a close relative of Ankylosaurus, showcases well-preserved tail clubs that bear evidence of wear and healing. Also, shattered and healed osteoderms in the pelvic region suggest repeated use of the club in fights with other members of its species. These discoveries challenge previous perceptions of ankylosaurids as solely defensive creatures, highlighting a complex behavior pattern that includes aggression and social hierarchy. Dana Sukas if you think the T-Rex was the most terrifying creature that has ever lived on our planet, then you have no idea about this monster. An enormous Cretaceous crocodile relative hunted dinosaurs, ripping them apart using powerful jaws lined with teeth the size of bananas. Known as Dinosuchus, which means terrible crocodile in Greek, this lineage of semi-aquatic reptiles certainly lived up to its name. They were among the biggest predators in their watery North American habitats, 
where they lived between 75 million and 82 million years ago. And with bodies at least 33 feet or 10 meters long, they could subdue just about any animal that wandered within reach, including dinosaurs. While Dinosuchus shared many features with its crocodilian relatives, a couple of peculiarities set them apart. Their broad, elongated heads ended in a bulbous snout, a shape that is unique among this group of reptiles. At the end of the snout are two large vents, which are also unique to Dinosuchus. Scientists have yet to uncover the function of the apertures and snout shape, though they may be linked to thermoregulation and may have helped the terror crocs keep cool. In scientific discourse, researchers frequently employ broad classifications, like crocodiliforms, instead of more specific terms such as crocodiles or alligators when discussing Cretaceous species. Crocodiliforms exhibited diverse shapes and inhabited various environments during the Cretaceous period. For instance, creatures like Caprosuchus from North Africa likely dwelled on land, while others were adapted to fully marine lifestyles. Scientists examining growth rings in the bony plates, called scutes, which were embedded in Dinosuchus' skin, found that it gained its giant size by living longer rather than growing faster. Each Dinosuchus might have taken over 35 years to reach full adult size, and the oldest individuals may have lived for more than 50 years. This was a completely different growth strategy than that of large dinosaurs, which reached adult size much more quickly and had shorter lifespans. Modern saltwater crocodiles have the strongest recorded bite of any living animal, with a maximum force of 16,440 newtons for a 4.59 meters or 15.1 feet specimen. The bite force of Dinosuchus far exceeded this, and this has been estimated to reach exceptionally high numbers, up to 102,803 newtons. It is unknown what happened to the Dinosuchus and how they became extinct. They disappeared before the main mass extinction at the end of the age of dinosaurs. Carcharodontosaurus Meet Carcharodontosaurus, the shark-toothed lizard, a massive carnivorous dinosaur that roamed North Africa during the late Cretaceous period, roughly 99 to 94 million years ago. It belonged to the theropod group and was one of the largest carnivorous animals to have ever walked the earth. German paleontologist Ernst Stromer formally described Carcharodontosaurus in 1931. The dinosaur's name was inspired by the shark-like serrations on the teeth, reminiscent of the great white shark. Carcharodontosaurus possessed a large, lightly built skull, measuring over 1.6 meters or 5.2 feet in length, comparable to that of the largest Tyrannosaurus skulls. Its jaws were lined with long, sharp, recurved teeth, each serrated like the blade of a saw. The skull featured expanded fossae and fenestrae, hollow spaces and sockets such as for the eyes, which made it lighter without significantly compromising strength. Such adaptions were crucial for a predator of its size, allowing for swift and efficient movement. Carcharodontosaurus saharicus was around 12 meters or 39.3 feet in length, with a weight of around 6.2 tons. These dimensions cement Carcharodontosaurus as one of the largest known theropod dinosaurs, rivaling Spinosaurus, Giganotosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus in size. However, it's the balance of size and agility that sets this predator apart. Despite its relatively small forelimbs, akin to other large theropods, its hind limbs were robust and muscular, supporting rapid acceleration and pursuit. Its elongated tail served as a crucial counterbalance, ensuring stability during high-speed chases or forceful attacks. The animal's sharp, serrated teeth were its primary tools for slicing through flesh, allowing it to tackle prey much larger than itself. The anterior bite force of Carcharodontosaurus saharicus 
was estimated to be 11,312 newtons, while the posterior bite force was 25,449 newtons. This is much lower than that of Tyrannosaurus, implying that it did not eat bones. Theropods such as Cacarodontosaurus, Allosaurus, and Acrocanthosaurus have enlarged lacrimal crests, whose purpose is unknown. Paleontologist Daniel Chur hypothesized that these crests were used for headbutting between individuals, but how durable they are has not been studied. Its greatest degree of binocular vision was at higher elevations, suggesting that Carcharodontosaurus may have habitually held its head at a downward 40 degree angle, with its eyes facing up accordingly to achieve maximal binocular vision. The range of vision seen in these allosaurids is comparable to that of crocodiles, suggesting that they were ambush predators. They likely sensed prey via motion parallax between prey and background, with a narrow binocular field of vision helping predators judge prey distances and time attacks. Giganotosaurus Giganotosaurus was one of the largest meat-eating dinosaurs. It roamed modern-day Argentina during the late Cretaceous period, about 99.6 to 97 million years ago. Giganotosaurus was one of the largest known terrestrial carnivores, but the exact size has been hard to determine due to the incompleteness of the remains found so far. Estimates for the most complete specimen range from a length of 12 to 13 meters, 39 to 43 feet, a skull 1.53 to 1.80 meters in length, and a weight of 4.2 to 13.8 tons. Part of the family Carcharodontosauridae, Giganotosaurus is one of the most completely known members of the group, which includes other very large theropods, such as the closely related Maposaurus and Carcharodontosaurus. Giganotosaurus is thought to have been homeothermic, with a metabolism between that of a mammal and a reptile, which would have enabled fast growth. It would have been capable of closing its jaws quickly, capturing and bringing down prey by delivering powerful bites. The chin may have helped in resisting stress when a bite was delivered against prey. Models suggest that Giganotosaurus could run up to 31.3 miles per hour, or 50.4 kilometers an hour. Any faster and the animal would lose its stability and fall over. Some estimates propose that the dinosaur had a bite force several times weaker than that of a T-Rex, which suggests Giganotosaurus may have hunted by inflicting slicing wounds instead of biting, a tactic that would have allowed it to take down very large prey that it couldn't have gotten its jaws around. Elasmosaurus Elasmosaurus is a genus of plesiosaur that lived in North America during the late Cretaceous period, about 80.5 million years ago. The first specimen was discovered in 1867 near Fort Wallace, Kansas, and was sent to the American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope, who named it Elasmosaurus platyurus in 1868. The generic name means thin plate reptile, and the specific name means flat tailed. Only one incomplete Elasmosaurus skeleton is definitely known consisting of a fragmentary skull, the spine, and the pectoral and pelvic girdles, and a single species is recognized today. Other species are now considered invalid or have been moved to other genera. Measuring 10.3 meters or 34 feet in length, Elasmosaurus would have had a streamlined body with paddle-like limbs, a short tail, a small head, and an extremely long neck. The neck alone was around 7.1 meters or 23 feet long. Along with its relative Alberta Nectes, it was one of the longest necked animals to have lived, with the second largest number of neck vertebrae known, 72, for fewer than Alberta Nectes. The skull would have been slender and triangular, with large fang-like teeth at the front and smaller teeth towards the back. It had six teeth in each premaxilla of the upper jaw, and may have had 14 teeth in the maxilla and 19 in the dentary of the lower jaw. 
most of the neck vertebrae were compressed sideways and bore a longitudinal crest or keel along the sides. The family Elasmosauridae was based on the genus Elasmosaurus, the first recognized member of this group of long-necked plesiosaurs. Elasmosaurids were well adapted for aquatic life and used their flippers for swimming. Contrary to earlier depictions, their necks were not very flexible and could not be held high above the water surface. It is unknown what their long necks were used for, but they may have had a function in feeding. Elasmosaurids probably ate small fish and marine invertebrates, seizing them with their long teeth and may have used gastroliths, stomach stones, to help digest their food. Elasmosaurus is known from the Pierre Shale Formation, which represents marine deposits from the Western Interior Seaway. The paddles of plesiosaurs were so rigid and specialized for swimming that they could not have come on land to lay eggs like sea turtles. Therefore, they probably gave live birth, viviparity, to their young, like some species of sea snakes. It is possible that Elasmosaurus and its kin stalked schools of fish, concealing themselves below and moving the head slowly up as they approached. The eyes of the animal were at the top of the head and allowed them to see directly upward. This stereoscopic vision would have helped it to find small prey. Hunting from below would also have been possible, with prey silhouetted in the sunlight while concealed in the dark waters below. Elasmosaurids probably ate small bony fish and marine invertebrates, as their small, non-kinetic skulls would have limited the size of the prey they could eat. Also, with their long, slender teeth adapted for seizing prey and not tearing, Elasmosaurids most certainly swallowed their prey whole. Pteranodon is a genus of pterosaur that included some of the largest known flying reptiles, with Pteranodon longiceps having a wingspan of over 6 meters or 20 feet. They lived during the late Cretaceous geological period of North America in present-day Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Alabama. More fossil specimens of Pteranodon have been found than any other pterosaur, with about 1,200 specimens known to science many of them well-preserved with nearly complete skulls and articulated skeletons. Pteranodon was the first pterosaur found outside of Europe. Its fossils first were found by Othniel Charles Marsh in 1871 in the late Cretaceous Smoky Hill chalk deposits of western Kansas. While the first Pteranodon wing bones were collected by Marsh and Cope in the early 1870s, the first Pteranodon skull was found in 1876. Adult male Pteranodon were among the largest pterosaurs and were the largest flying animals known until the late 20th century when the giant Asdarkid pterosaurs were discovered. The wingspan of an average adult male Pteranodon was 5.6 meters or 18 feet. Adult females were much smaller, averaging 3.8 meters or 12 feet in wingspan. Unlike earlier pterosaurs such as Rampharhynchus and Pterodactylus, Pteranodon had toothless beaks, similar to those of birds. Pteranodon beaks were made of solid, bony margins that projected from the base of the jaws. The beaks were long, slender, and ended in thin, sharp points. The wing shape of Pteranodon suggests that it would have flown rather like modern-day albatross. While most of a Pteranodon flight would have depended on soaring, like long-winged seabirds, it probably required an occasional active rapid burst of flapping. Pteranodon was notable for its skull crest, though the function of this crest has been a subject of debate. Most explanations have focused on the blade-like backward-pointed crest of male Pteranodon longiceps, however, and ignored the wide range of variation across age and sex. The fact that the crests vary so much rules out most practical functions other than for use in mating displays. Therefore, display was probably the main function of the crest, and any other functions were secondary. Adult pteranodon specimens may be divided into two distinct classes, small and large, and the large size class being about one and a half times larger than the small class, and the small class being twice as common as the large class. 
both size classes lived alongside each other, and while researchers had previously suggested that they represent different species, Christopher Bennett showed that the differences between them are consistent with the concept that they represent females and males, and that Pteranodon species were sexually dimorphic. T-Rex Tyrannosaurus rex was one of the most, if not the most, terrifying prehistoric creature that has ever existed on our planet. Fossils are found in a variety of rock formations, dating to the latest Campanian Maastrichtian ages of the late Cretaceous period, 72.7 to 66 million years ago. The most complete specimen measures up to 12.3 to 12.4 meters, or 40 to 41 feet in length, but according to most modern estimates, Tyrannosaurus could have exceeded sizes of 13 meters, or 43 feet in length, 3.7 to 4 meters, or 12 to 13 feet in hip height, and 8.8 .8 tons in mass. One feature of Tyrannosaurus rex that everyone makes fun of is its arms, which seem disproportionately tiny compared to the rest of its massive body. T. rex's arms were over 3 feet long, however, and may have been capable of bench pressing 400 pounds each. In any event, T. rex didn't have the smallest arm to body ratio among carnivorous dinosaurs. That was Carnotaurus, whose arms looked like tiny nubs. The dinosaurs of the Mesozoic era obviously didn't brush their teeth or floss. Some experts think shards of rotten, bacteria-infested meat constantly lodged in its closely packed teeth gave Tyrannosaurus rex a septic bite, which infected and eventually killed its wounded prey. This process likely would have taken days or weeks, by which time some other meat-eating dinosaur would have reaped the rewards. It's difficult to infer a dinosaur's lifespan from its fossils, but based on analysis of existing specimens, paleontologists speculate that Tyrannosaurus rex may have lived as long as 30 years. Because this dinosaur was atop the food chain, it would most likely have died from old age, disease, or hunger rather than attacks by fellow theropods, except when it was young and vulnerable. Some of the 50-ton titanosaurs that lived alongside T. rex might have had lifespans of more than a hundred years. For years, paleontologists argued about whether T. rex was a savage killer or an opportunistic scavenger. That is, did it hunt its food or tuck into the carcasses of dinosaurs already felled by old age or disease? Current thinking is that there's no reason Tyrannosaurus rex couldn't have done both, as would any carnivore that wanted to avoid starvation. Some paleontologists believe that all tyrannosaurs, including T. rex, were covered in feathers at some point during their lives, most likely when they hatched, a conclusion supported by the discovery of feathered Asian tyrannosaurs, such as Delong and the almost T. rex-sized Euturanus. Some tyrannosaurus fossils show bite marks from other tyrannosaurs, so it's clear that they fought each other, whether over food or mates or just because they were cannibalistic at some point. We know that close relatives of Tyrannosaurus sometimes lived together because there are fossils of groups who were buried together, but we don't know for sure if they hunted alone or in packs like lions and wolves do today. So far, no groups of Tyrannosaurus skeletons have been found. Studies have found that the Tyrannosaurus rex was also rather gifted when it came to its other senses. They had large olfactory nerves, which indicates that they had a heightened sense of smell allowing them to track their prey. Argentinosaurus In the vast expanse of prehistoric Earth, the Argentinosaurus stands out as a giant among giants. This sauropod dinosaur lived in the lands of modern-day Argentina during the late Cretaceous period, 96 to 92 million years ago. Argentinosaurus's fragmentary remains suggest it was the largest land animal ever known to science, the discovered elements, back vertebrae, a sacrum, and femurs, provide crucial insights into its massive structure. The vertebrae, colossal even by titanosaur standards, suggest a robust and sturdy animal, capable of supporting an immense body. The complete femur, measuring around 2.5 meters in length, along with a similarly sized shaft of another, indicates powerful limbs that could manage to carry this giant. 
by comparing the known parts with more complete skeletons of related titanosaurs, scientists have developed a range of size estimates, lengths of 30 to 35 meters, 98 to 115 feet, and weights between 65 and 80 tons or even 100 tons can easily crown Argentinosaurus as the largest known land animal. These estimations are derived from scaling up smaller sauropods and using mathematical models to calculate mass. For context, its length rivals that of a basketball court and its weight is equivalent to a herd of about 10 elephants. Such comparisons help us grasp the sheer scale of Argentinosaurus, a true titan of the Mesozoic era. Argentinosaurus's massive size suggests a lifestyle adapted to consuming vast quantities of vegetation. It possessed a long neck, enabling it to reach high into trees or sweep over large areas to graze. This feeding strategy would have required a large territory to provide enough food to sustain its enormous body. The slow movements implied by its limb structure suggest Argentinosaurus was not a migratory dinosaur. The animal most probably lived in rich, resource-abundant environments that could support its dietary needs. The giant size of Argentinosaurus and other sauropods was likely made possible by a combination of factors. These include fast and energy-efficient feeding allowed for by the long neck and lack of mastication, fast growth and fast population recovery due to their many small offspring. Advantages of giant sizes would likely have included the ability to keep food inside the digestive tract for lengthy periods to extract a maximum of energy and increased protection against predators. As a result of physical and biological constraints, there's an upper limit to how large any given dinosaur egg can be. Considering its huge size, Argentinosaurus probably brushed up against that limit. Based on comparisons with the eggs of other titanosaurs, such as the eponymous genus Titanosaurus, it seems likely that Argentinosaurus eggs measured about a foot in diameter, and that females laid up to 10 or 15 eggs at a time, increasing the odds that at least one hatchling would evade predators and survive to adulthood. Did Argentinosaurus hold its neck vertically, the better to nibble the leaves of tall trees, or did it forage in a more horizontal posture? The answer to this question is still a mystery, not only for Argentinosaurus, but for pretty much all long-necked sauropods and titanosaurs. The issue is that a vertical posture would have placed enormous demands on this hundred-ton herbivore's heart. Imagine having to pump blood 40 feet into the air, 50 or 60 times per minute, given our current state of knowledge about Argentinosaurus's physiology. The Argentinosaurus' large size didn't make them an easy predator, even though they were not able to defend themselves well. One dinosaur that preyed on the Argentinosaurus was likely the Maposaurus, which is one of the largest known theropods. The Maposaurus hunted in packs to bring down a single adult Argentinosaurus. Larger carnivorous dinosaurs would have also posed a threat to the Argentinosaurus. The Giganotosaurus was a large theropod dinosaur that also lived in Argentina during the same period. Since the Argentinosaurus took years to develop into a large adult, it is possible that young juveniles or hatchlings were easier to hunt than adults. Zephyctinus Back in the Cretaceous period, large bony fish were among the most dominant animal species in the world's oceans. Zephyctinus is one of such remarkable bony fish genera. The massive fish grew to an average length of about 5 to 6 meters, or 16 to 20 feet, making it one of the largest bony fish in the Cretaceous period. Scientists also consider the Zephyctinus to be one of the most ferocious sea creatures to have ever existed. It had powerful bulldog-like jaws with large fangs at the front that was useful for impaling prey during an attack. Zephyctinus ruled in the Western Interior Seaway, the prehistoric sea that covered much of North America during the Cretaceous period. It had an elongated and streamlined body, which is expected to be fast-swimming predatory fish. 
The Zephactinus's streamlined body is similar to that of modern-day barracudas. This impressively large fish reached lengths of about 15 to 20 feet, or 4.5 to 6 meters, and weighed around 1,500 to 2,500 pounds, or 680 to 1,130 kilograms, on average. The Zephactinus's tail was heterocerical, meaning the upper lobe of the tail was larger and more prominent than the lower lobe. This tail shape would have helped with stability and improved maneuverability during swimming. Experts have estimated the likely top speed of this massive fish to be about 60 kilometers per hour or 37 miles per hour. In addition to being a fast swimmer, Zephactinus was probably capable of leaping out of the water, similar to modern dolphins. Zephactinus is considered a voracious marine predator. Given its size, it was probably capable of feeding on any of the smaller animals present in its ecosystem. This would have included small bony fish, ancient sharks, turtles, and even marine reptiles like the mosasaurs that were alive during the Cretaceous period. Zephactinus reproduced sexually, exhibiting an oviparous mode of reproduction. This means they laid eggs that hatched outside the mother's body, just like most fish species do today. Not a lot is known about the reproduction and mating behavior of the Zephactinus, but it most likely involved the female releasing eggs into the water, which the male then fertilized. They exhibited no parental care, and the fertilized eggs hatched into juvenile fish on their own. Zephactinus belongs to the order Ichthyodectiformes. This is a group of prehistoric ray-finned fish that were quite abundant during the late Cretaceous period. The evolutionary history of this order of fish can be traced back to the early Jurassic period, around 200 million years ago. However, the genus Zephactinus itself only emerged during the late few decades of the Cretaceous period, approximately 100 million years ago, and was alive till the end of the period, about 65 million years ago. Archelon Archelon is an extinct marine turtle from the late Cretaceous and is the largest turtle ever to have been documented, with the biggest specimen measuring 4.6 meters or 15 feet from head to tail and 2.2 to 3.2 tons in body mass. It is known only from the Pierre Shale and has one species, Archelon Iskyros. The genus was named in 1895 by American paleontologist George Reber Wieland, based on a skeleton from South Dakota, who placed it into the extinct family Protostegidae. Archelon was an obligate carnivore. The thick plastron indicates the animal probably spent a lot of time on the soft, muddy seafloor, likely a slow-moving bottom feeder. According to American paleontologist Samuel Wendon Williston, the jaws were adapted for crushing, implying the turtle ate large mollusks and crustaceans. The Archelon could float and swim on the sea at its leisure thanks to its long flippers. I could swim long distances with the help of my flippers. It was always accompanied in the sea by a large number of other fish who preferred to swim alongside it. The Archelon was massive, but it had no idea how to fight or defend itself in the face of an open attack. It never drew its head back or its helpful flippers from within its shell. It moved in a flamboyant manner, unconcerned about the sudden attack of larger predators such as sharks. The primary predators of Archelon sea turtles were prehistoric sharks and the Mosasaur, a giant sea creature that had an alligator-like head and jaws and a shark-like body. However, it is believed the giant turtles became extinct because of climate change, the associated cooling climate, and the shrinking of the western interior seaway. Increasing predation on eggs and hatchlings also likely played a role in the creature's end.